minimizing muscle wasting is integral for the survival of cancer patients. I will say this with a strong degree of confidence that if cancers are caught in early stages, they are very treatable to the point of complete remission. But the problem with a lot of cancers... Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Joe Zandel. Joe has a PhD in cancer biology. In this episode, we go through some of the fundamentals of cancer biology and prevention. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Seam. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really enjoy your content on Instagram about cancer, and it's very like educational for people who um, you know don't really understand the physiology and uh, what it, what is cancer. So yeah, I'm really excited to uh, talk with you. So maybe we can like start with giving like a brief overview of you know what is cancer and why is it so like lethal? Why is it why is it one of the like leading causes of death um, in the in the world in like developed uh, countries? Yeah. So, I mean, typically when I try and describe cancer to people, I, I typically just try and keep it as basic as possible. So what I tell people is that cancer is, is a disease that, um, that comes about when you have loss of checkpoints that normally keep cells in check because they are checkpoints. And there's a lot of things that can obviously correct for things like DNA division and immune cell recognition of abnormal cells. And it's when we lose our ability to detect these events that enables uh, continuous growth and uh, cancer cell uh, generation and progression, if not corrected. Now, our bodies are always going through this mechanistically of, you know, checking each cell for its integrity. And uh, in, in normal context, um, you know, things that look abnormal are quickly eradicated by very programmed mechanisms. Um, like programmed cell death as an example. If something looks weird, the cell will be programmed to die via a process called apoptosis or apoptosis, as many people like to say. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, those are typically mechanisms which, you know, can induce cancers later on. And as to why um, maybe you've seen that it's increasing in prevalence and why it's, why it's a, a very common disease and, and in some cases very lethal, uh, there's a variety of different reasons for that, um, depending on the type of cancer. Um, and actually, more, more and more cancers are becoming increasingly more treatable, uh, given to uh, technological advances within the, even the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, we have significantly greater treatment options now. So despite cancer incidence increasing for things like colorectal cancers, which we can touch on, things mm -hmm. like pancreatic cancers, esophageal cancers, and even lung cancers, uh, many cancers despite having great incidents like breast cancer, have extremely great survival rates within 95% five-year survival rates because of the treatments that we've developed. So it's always contextual, right? And so, mm. um, you know, it, it, a lot of it depends on our environment. Um, there are rare genetic heritable events that we can touch on, but, um, mm. you know, I think I've rambled enough uh, on, on this question uh, right. to give people enough to think about. Yeah, so it, it kind of is... A failure of the immune system to eliminate the cancer in one way yeah yeah uh, one of many ways yeah mm. and uh, there's obviously like then like different thresholds where it occurs and different i guess people have different amounts of these mutations that occur depending on genetics and environment and lifestyle that uh, create the situation where the cancer can develop and bypass the checkpoint sure and I, you know i want to emphasize and try and make this as clear as possible. Sometimes, and very often, you don't need either heritable mutations to induce a physical change which can lead to cancers. So mm. a lot of my work has focused on the study of epigenetics. And so sometimes you can have spontaneous things that even independent of mutation, um, which may even lead to mutation later on, independent of mutation can induce uh, cancers. So there's mm. these spontaneous events that can sometimes lead to genetic events. And I think that people need to understand that as well. Mm, right. I guess one thing that you know, many people have heard is that you have cancer all the time and it's just that at some point you get it or something. <laughs> so what is, what is the actual case here? Yeah, so that, that's one of those phrases that I've, I've actively tried to correct um, because uh, it, it's not accurate. Um, and I think people in general have this misunderstanding that just because our bodies are always going through these checkpoints to regulate the level of abnormalities, 
and the level of imperfections that naturally occur in our bodies, that's not the same thing as having cancer. Our bodies are actively doing things because it's a very integral part of normal cell biology to be able to have these checkpoints. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very different to have checkpoints than it is to have cancer. Cancer is loss of regulation of these checkpoints. Mm. And so despite our bodies regulating our normal cell biology to maintain balance within our bodies, that's very different from actually having cancer because in cancer, you lose those abilities because otherwise it wouldn't be cancer. Mm. So just to keep it simple, no, we, we don't all have cancer cells in our body. And I've actually, um, I've made a pretty in-depth video just talking about this from a cell cycle regulatory perspective um, because the checkpoints that regulate DNA repair are very tightly regulated and there's many of them. Um, so I made a YouTube video uh, which describes that in depth that people can check out um, mm. after this video. Gotcha. And what is like the cause of death with cancer? Like when does it become lethal? Um, yeah, so of course that depends on the type of cancer. Typically, um, I will say this with a strong degree of confidence that if cancers are caught in early stages, they are very treatable um, to the point of complete remission. But the problem with a lot of cancers, um, depending on where they're located, for example, something like pancreatic cancer, the reason that pancreatic cancer and esophageal cancer have the highest lethality rates in terms of all cancers is because they are very hard to detect because often the symptoms associated with the development of those cancers are sometimes very normal symptoms that people may experience. Um, so a good example of this is my mom. Um, she passed away from esophageal cancer when I was 17, and that's kind of stimulated my progression into getting a PhD in cancer biology. Um, and her cancer, when, when it was developing, she, you know, we're Italian family. We eat a lot of... Um, Sorry, Italian American. There's a big distinction there. Um, Italian American family. We eat a lot of, you know, red sauces and, and relatively acidic foods. And a common thing amongst Italian American families and Italians is sometimes acid reflux. And so, acid reflux um, is also a symptom of developing esophageal cancers. Mm. Um, and of course, we later realized. I mean, even even many doctors realized later on that, um, you know. When you can't resolve certain symptoms, that's when you need to to start looking into into certain detection methods, like an endoscopy. For an esophagus, it's very easy. You can put a microscope, a small microscope, down the uh, the esophagus, and you can see the developing uh, tumors or polyps in an esophagus. Um, and so it was detected too late. At that point, mm -hmm. you know she already exhibited symptoms, and it was unresolved. You can't do that for something like pancreatic cancer, though. So the detection methods for pancreatic cancers, despite presenting somewhat common symptoms that might be related to other ailments, you can't put a microscope down all the way into the pancreas. Um, and now we have better detection modalities to detect uh, developing pancreatic cancers through things like blood tests. Um, but we also have better radiologic methods, uh, more targeted theranostic approaches, so to speak, uh, using radioactive isotopes to better detect uh, things like pancreatic cancers uh, nowadays. So expect to see that those are on the rise in terms of reducing uh, prevalence of pancreatic cancers and increasing early detection for them. But that's, you know, oftentimes our ability to treat a cancer depends on when we detect it. Mm. Um, so for those more lethal cancers, they're, again, they're typically caught later stage, and that's what... Um, increases their their mortality rate because they've developed in such a way that now um, they're significantly harder to treat because they've evolved in such a way where, you know, one treatment won't work, one type of surgery won't work. We need combinatorial approaches to um, combat multiple evolved mechanisms that enable that tumor uh, to grow. Mm. And there's also a high degree of variability between people as well. Right. So it makes it very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, sorry to hear about your mother. Like my grandfather also died uh, to colorectal cancer when he was yeah. 36. So he's he was like super young, and you know, colorectal yeah. cancer is also able to um, treat or you know, kind of prevent once you get it, once you detect it early enough. But I guess he was like a special case that no one would have suspected him to have it at <laughs> in his 30s uh, anyway. So uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. And I, again, you know, I'm sorry to hear that about your family member as well. But um, did he have something like Lynch syndrome or? I, I I don't know that much about. I mean, he, you know, he lived in uh, the Soviet Union, <laughs> the, the formerly occupied Soviet Union of Estonia. Okay. But, uh, I mean, I think he smoked and he probably drank alcohol. So you know, he probably had didn't have like any, any like a healthy uh, lifestyle. So those were like the probably the biggest risk factors that he had. Like he wasn't obese, yeah. wasn't obese, but he he was like a sailor. So I, <laughs> I guess he was uh, smoking uh, quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that those are significant factors in the development of his specific cancer type, but they're certainly they're certainly risk factors. Mm. Um, I, I can't imagine living as a sailor is a, <laughs> a healthy way of life either, depending on your position on the ship. Um, mm. And I do know that from a dietary perspective, sailors, um, if they're out at sea for a long period of time, the consumption of preserved foods can increase risks as well. So high salted foods. Poor nutrient density, low fiber, those sorts of things can increase risks significantly for colorectal cancer. So that's yeah. probably why you've seen on my station that uh, I'm trying to really get people to eat soluble, you know, sometimes even non-fermentable sources of fiber uh, to yeah. implement into their diet. Because I don't think um, that's stressed enough in in the, I guess, the wellness space and health space. Mm. I want to take a quick break to let you know that you can now get my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. It contains 24 chapters ranging from the biology of aging to all the major chronic diseases such as heart disease, kidney disease, neurodegeneration, and I also cover over 70 clinically relevant biomarkers for chronic diseases and their optimal ranges. You can get the book from the link in the description. One thing then is like the cancer is this uh, growth or cancer is characterized by this uh, uncontrollable growth that kind of spreads across the across the body mm. and uh is that part of the like the way that it uh contributes to the lethality or like the fatality of uh, the cancer that is, is it like some some of like the growth aspect uh harmful in like in excessive amounts yeah no absolutely so again um with later stage developing cancers comes this um this premise of metastasis so when things are metastasized of course even so earlier I said when we detect, to backtrack a little bit, cancers are more treatable when they're detected in early stage, significantly more treatable. As they advance, um, they're going to be more treatable if they don't metastasize as well. So there's stages. When a tumor metastasizes, it's, it's going to significantly challenge things as well because now that tumor has adopted characteristics to not only get up and move from its original site, assuming it's a solid tumor, but it's adopted characteristics that now enable it to get up and move, uh, extravasate into or um, squeeze through the blood vasculature. That's the fancy word for extravasation uh, into the blood vasculature and move to another place of, uh, in the body. But not only move to another place in the body, be able to plant and continue to grow in, a, in a, an entirely different organ from where it originally adapted. Mm. So when I try and teach people about cancer, of course, there's this cell growth and metastasis component about understanding cancer cell biology, but there's there's many more things called the hallmarks of cancers. And I've done a brief, tried uh, well, I've tried my best to try and simplify these hallmarks. There's about 16 different hallmarks of cancers that we've discovered um, and implemented into our studies over the past, you know, again, 30 plus years of of really amazing discoveries. Um, Outside of metastasis and you know dysregulated growth of, of cancer cells, you have dysregulated energetics. So the, there's a lot of changes in enzymes and how they function inside of cells, um, and the, the the interactions that they might play with um, controlling metabolic balance inside of cells. So I saw you made a post today about uh, nicotinamide or NAD metabolism. Mm. I've actually published papers about how. Sometimes in specific ovarian cancers, they can upregulate enzymes like NAMPT, which is a rate-limiting right. enzyme of, of redox metabolism. And so oftentimes we try and inhibit these enzymes in cancers because they upregulate them to kind of maintain balance by upregulating these enzymes to maintain uh, uh, reduction of, of oxidative stress, which can further drive cancer development. So mm. outside of energetics, there's, of course, dysregulation and epigenetics, which again is very diverse. Epigenetics is own, on its own could be pretty much all of these hallmarks of cancers if you think about it in a very diverse way. And actually there was a new paper that came out that 
that kind of uh, discuss that, and I'm actually going to review it soon on my on my channel, mm. uh, hopefully in a productive way. Outside of that, there's um, microbial effects, um, you know, because obviously we're not just our own cells that we've inherited from our parents. We're, you know, we're we're a whole environment of organisms. So we're all covered in bacteria on our skin and fungi, and in many ways they help us live our lives safely. But also in our colon, um, microbes like bacteria and even viruses um, can help to regulate our digestion. And sometimes these are also dysregulated in cancers. And they're even further dysregulated in some cases, um, depending on specific treatments we might give. So we have to be careful about what treatments we give because they can also shift the microbes in in our gut um, during someone's cancer treatment. So there's all these factors that kind of converge and often happen uh, on top of each other in types of uh, many types of cancers. And, mm. uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, it makes it very challenging to treat when you have all these different converging mechanisms that we know about the root causes, so to speak, but because they're converging from a variety of different angles, it becomes very challenging to, tr uh, to treat, especially mm. in later stages of disease. Does yeah. that make sense? I know sometimes I, I go on a tangent, but please stop me if, yeah. if uh, you have any questions or concerns or anything yeah, yeah. i understand like um i've also seen the the papers on the hallmarks of of cancer and yeah. it's kind of you know similar to the hallmarks of aging that uh, yeah. have also been uh, kind of uh, discovered or created and uh, some of them are like quite similar like inflammation this chronic inflammation is one of the hallmarks of cancer mm -hmm. and is also in a hallmark of uh, aging as well so yeah you know, age, it's more so age, for from a cancer perspective it's more so um, cancer cells ability to hide from the immune system. And mm. in many cases, it's induction of specific inflama inflammatory responses because there's a good level of inflammation too, right? So like we, right now, like right. both of us have some level of acute inflammation to resolve, you know, damage or pathogenic responses. Yeah. Um, but in regards to aging, it's also this aspect of Again, DNA regulation. So one thing we often see that leads to um, multiple copies of chromosomes being made um, in cancer cells, we, we see this in, in cancers where there's frequent genetic instability, so to speak. Hmm. Um, you know, you can have telomere shortening. So as we age, our telomeres become shorter and shorter because cells can only divide a certain amount of times. And this is something coined by uh, Dr. Leonard Hayflick, actually. Um, who did his work at the same the uh, the same institute where I did my thesis work, uh, same area, and um, you know as we age, like you mentioned, in aging processes, you have telomere shortening. But in cancers, this happens a lot quicker and significantly less regulated. So there's a lot of poor trade offs and negative effects that come from cancer cells somewhat selfishness to continuously divide, and in doing so, they create um, a lot of really genetic really significant genetic errors that lead to chromosomal fusions um, and some types of B-cell-related cancers, uh, leukemias. Um, we see fusion events, uh, one particularly called the Philadelphia chromosome um, that leads to genetic instability in uh, some types of leukemias. And there's a variety of others that, you know, obviously we can continue to talk about. But yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of overlap between aging processes and cancers because in, in many ways, cancer is... A disease of aging and so that's that's often why we see as people get older because of a lot of dysregulation in, in a variety of different pathways there increases their likelihood for for cancers and you also referenced this uh in, in your post today about nad metabolism mm. good on yeah. you man it was a good post <laughs> yeah i mean it's actually interesting because like you said like the cancer can use the nampt to survive and uh it's it's also like happens in some other of these similar pathways like autophagy that mm -hmm. uh, is you know quote unquote considered to be like some longevity holy grail and anti cancer mechanism sure. but but at the same time yeah like some cancers use autophagy to actually survive so uh, yeah so like a very tricky disease like the cancer is very clever like there's almost like this evolutionary arms race <laughs> between you and the cancer uh, and yeah, uh, it's the same with doctors as well trying to figure out the kind of a uh, cure for it and so far. Not yeah, really it is. It is an evolutionary arms race, and that's kind of how I like to put it. But I also, I also need people to understand that it's, it's not very pretty, and it's not as intelligent as you think. Because mm -hmm. if 
evolution, right? Evolution as human beings, as any living being on this planet, like we, we need to live, right? So cancer, cancer is the antithesis, is the opposite of that. Um, it's the loss of the regulation of evolutionary mechanisms to sustain that level of balance. So as you point out in cancers, um, there's this disbalance or imbalance with, um, with things like autophagy. And um, in many ways, cancer cells are selfish. So they'll upregulate mechanisms associated with autophagy um, to maintain redox potential and those sorts of things and try and steal resources from their environment to sustain their, their level of energetics to keep growing. Um, so in more ways, to me, they're more like a parasite. Um, I want to say this clearly, they're like a parasite. They're not a parasite. Um, and there's, there's a lot of confusion online because there's a lot of people that will say that cancer is a disease uh, of a parasite. But this understanding comes from evolution itself. And so you can have parasitism in an ecosystem because, again, we are ecosystems without having parasites present. And so the way that cancer cells operate in our bodies, they are parasitic in a way, but they're typically not caused by parasites. Mm. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't some cancers that can be caused by parasites because there are, um, but it, it's, a, it's a more parasitic interaction than it is right. a, um, you know, a carefully regulated interaction. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So like one question is that um, so it's, it's not like a entity or something like that is not like a certain strain of bacteria. So uh, it's like a mutation in your own cells, if I'm not mistaken, then, right? But is it um, like, is it like, uh, is it like, is it, because like, you know, for example, you mentioned the Hayflick, Hayflick limit. Mm -hmm. Once a cell reaches the Hayflick limit, it usually turns senescent which uh, means that the, the cell is like dead, quote unquote, but it's metabolically active. Right. And it secretes these pro-inflammatory cytokines, it's you know, characteristic of aging. And mm -hmm. the other option, and, and the reason it turns senescent is to prevent it from becoming cancerous. So that's the like, reason we have senescent cells, uh, one of the reasons. Uh, so like, is the cancer then like, quote unquote, alive, or is it also like this dead, but metabolically active uh, tumorigenic yeah, so that's that's really interesting too because when when certain things become senescent as you point out they are metabolically active to a certain point up to that point they will eventually undergo a regulated uh cell death or apoptosis as we had mentioned. Hmm. Um but cancer cells are a little bit tricky because they can become senescent and they can also manipulate senescence within their microenvironment to make other cells in their environment become senescent as well through secretory um, materials to induce senescence. And so actually one of the papers that I published um, in relation to what I was talking about early, NAMPT um, metabolism, uh, there's this field of study that seeks to target these senescence pathways in cancers. And they're called, these drugs are called senolytics because we're basically inducing these senescent cells to undergo cell death using these um, inhibitors against processes that promote cell death. So oftentimes cancer cells will increase the amounts of proteins that enable the cell to keep being alive during their senescent state. And if we inhibit these proteins with specific inhibitors, something like a BCL2 inhibitor, which is anti-apoptotic, um, anti-cell death, if we inhibit BCL2 and the cell is relying on that, then, of course, if we inhibit something it's relying on, uh, we can initiate uh, even a senescent cell to, to die. Um, but again, this is independent of the secretory signal. So another aspect of senolytics is targeting the internal mechanisms of the cancer cells for something like BCL2 inhibitors, but also targeting the secretory factors like um, IL-6, IL-8, IL-1 beta. We can use immunotherapies or antibodies, small proteins, to inhibit the ability of those secreted proteins. Um, and this is a term called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, and this is called the SASP as an abbreviation, because, you know, scientists love to abbreviate things. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can get a double-pronged approach from using internal inhibitors for something like BCL2 and combinatorial therapies using immunotherapies to target those secreted uh, cytokines for 
treating senescence for tumors that we know are um, typically late stage becoming senescent and affecting their microenvironment. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's it's very complicated and and wildly diverse between uh, cancer types and even between patients. Mm. Right. Yeah, and it's like it's even more like interesting that you know if cancer is trying to survive, but it ends up killing the host. So like yeah. uh, it kind of <laughs> it's kind of interesting in that scenario. So look, why? Yeah, like is is it just like a random error? Like from an evolutionary perspective, like why did cancer develop? Like it's just like a random error, or um, does it have any like greater purpose? <laughs> yeah, um, man, this is a tough question because it, Im- it it implies that there's some sort of evolutionary favorable thing to having cancer. But again, I can say with a strong degree of certainty, there's no favorable outcomes when it comes to having cancer regarding an evolutionary perspective. Because again. If you have cancer for a prolonged period of time and you don't get treated, you will die. That's a fact. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases of spontaneous remission. Um, they can happen, but they are rare in comparison. Um, but I think also people need to understand that um, when it comes to mutations in cancers, um, Sometimes it can be, you don't always need mutations to have a developing cancer. And I, I think I said that earlier. Um, yeah, I know this is a really tough one. But again, I don't think there's, there's an evolutionary favorability to having, uh, to having cancer. Because right. again, it, it's, it's more like a, a parasitic ecosystem interaction. Again, not being an actual parasite, but it's a parasitic interaction um, that can eventually lead to, to a, a person's death. Because... You have these cells competing for resources amongst your normal cells. Um, and they have, for all intents and purposes, cancer cells, they are you at some point. They have all your materials. But, and excuse my language, there's really no other way to say this, but they become so fucked up at some point mm-hmm. that they're not you anymore. And that's when you have cancers killing people. Does mm. that make it? Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Like, you know, it's, it's just, you know, you, you could, you could like apply this to like some nation states as well. The same idea that certain entities or groups go rogue and they end up killing <laughs> everyone yeah. around them. So it's a uh, very kind of, <laughs> that's analogous. a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we can now shift to talking about um, what are like some of the low hanging fruits when it comes to preventing cancer, because that's, you know, the most effective way to make sure that you don't die to cancer is that not to get it in the first place so what are like the most obvious and simplest like lifestyle factors and uh some less obvious as well maybe like uh related to just the basics in general like uh, lifestyle related sure yeah i mean I, I get this question a lot and um i think people are literally sleeping on the basics mm-hmm. um you know i can't stress enough the importance of consistent exercise um you know, of course, you know, we can look at the literature. There's there's optimal exercises that people can do for increased disease risk reduction. But realistically, um, everyone has their own individual needs when it comes to not only their own nutrition and their own exercise plan, but also their ability to perform uh, specific exercises. So people, whatever it is, they just need to do it consistently and safely, whatever exercise that they they want to do. Um, It can be some sort of crazy exercise as long as they consistently uh, do it and it, you know, keeps them healthy over time. Um, It doesn't have to be, you know, going to the gym. If people don't like going to the gym, I like going to the gym. So I I, I go there frequently. I just actually got back from the gym before this. Um, But yeah, for regarding exercise, people just need to do something consistently and safely. And I tell people that all the time. From a dietary perspective, people need to consume a nutritionally rich, dietary profile online you'll see levels of extremism you know carnivore diets the best the vegan diets the best be vegetarian be pescatarian and often muddles things a lot but when we look at human physiology we have certain nutritional requirements and that's also going to to vary significantly depending on uh, our food availability in our environments or in our socioeconomic status so the thing that i try and get people to pay attention to is the quality of the food that they're eating 
You know, I occasionally eat ultra processed foods because I enjoy them. Um, there are some risks to some of these, these foods, obviously in terms of, um, you know, disease risks for cancers, not only cancers, things like diabetes and obesity. Um, but the problem becomes with those foods is when you overconsume them, that you have issues and that's not new knowledge. So people should be really cognizant of the, of the idea that consuming too much ultra processed foods can lead to bad health, uh, outcomes. Mm. Um, I don't know how much more simply to say that. So okay. uh, one you know, question here is fiber as well. And, and, you know, those sorts of things help as well. Yeah. One question Sorry. here, is, I guess many people might have as well is, is it with ultra processed food? It's obviously, it has a huge calorie component here and obesity is a risk factor for uh, cancer as well. So is it, is it with ultra processed food? Is it, uh, you know, the calorie risk that uh, you end up eating more calories and then you have worse health and worse body composition, or is there something independent in the ultra processed food that uh, increases the risk? So like some preservatives or some pro food processing or something like that in it. Sure. Yeah. So again, to keep this simple, it's, it's, it's all of those things. <laughs> um, and you know, people, like I said, people love to live in extremist camps and, and pick on, you know, preservatives and foods and synthetic dyes. I actually just recently made a video on that. I'm releasing this, this upcoming week. Um, so people like to pick on those things and have extreme points about them. Like you have to in avoid them entirely, but you know, to your point, it's, it is largely about excess caloric intake of ultra processed foods relative to an overall person's diet. Because when we look at the nutritional composition of these foods, and just for clarity, I'm not a nutritional scientist. I understand a lot about metabolism, but I'm not a nutritional scientist. So from, from a very basic perspective, when we look at the nutritional composition of these foods, it's more so that they're highly caloric, they're high levels of saturated fats, which, you know, obviously saturated fats yield a, a lot of calories. They require a lot of energy to be broken down in the body. Um, but relative to our overall diets, they don't consume or they don't have enough healthy things in them. Uh, they don't have enough high quality protein within them. They don't have, um, oftentimes they have a lot of added sugars. Um, and so mm. as, as, as you point out, people will consume a lot of these to the point where they're, they're full, right? Their, their hunger signals make them full. They eat a lot of them. And then they're not eating the, the vegetables alongside their meals, or they're not eating the, um, the, um, the, the steak or the chicken lean, lean meats. Typically, um, you know, I can sit down for dinner and, and easily, um, eat, eat a whole pint of ice cream if I wanted to. And I've actually, I've done that before and, uh, probably more frequently than I should have, but, um, you know, that's obviously not a, a high quality meal. I can have a little bit of ice cream after my meal, um, which I often do, um, alongside, you know, before my meal, I'll have like, you know, ensuring that some of my plate is, 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 is a, a lot of specific types of greens or vegetables, or maybe even a salad alongside a lean protein source, maybe a leaner cut of steak or chicken or pork or something like that. Um, and a healthy carbohydrate source, um, you know, something like mashed potatoes can be a great addition to a, a dish like that. So people need to be somewhat creative with their nutrition and not um, rely entirely on ultra processed foods for uh, for nutrients because they don't have all mm. the nutrients that people need to to live. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, it's I, a multitude of things as it always sure. is. Yeah, I think yeah, like the biggest component is obviously the calorie component, and but I yeah. I was wondering more about like the chemicals and like, or, you know, the, let's say these uh, preservatives or those kind of things in, in sure. the processed food. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's definitely risks as I, as I started out talking about, you know, synthetic dyes like red 40, mm. um, and, and various other dyes, you know, th there's sufficient enough literature now with variable levels of scientific integrity to suggest that these things do have risks. Um, and of course the more, zero, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's it's not a non-zero risk. Um, it might be a low risk because realistically, the amount of people consuming these things at a high enough dose to significantly increase cancer risks um, is relatively low. But um, mm. you know, even from a preservative uh, perspective, it's the same sort of uh, same sort of observation in the literature. So they are relatively low risk. But again, these things are not entirely additive. Um, you know, if a person's diet is 
entirely ultra processed foods, of course, they're getting enough of these things that are going to significantly increase their risks for for diseases like cancers. But mm. I would hope that people, you know, and sometimes this is a privilege argument and we have to think about socioeconomic status because in some societies, um, people don't have access to high quality foods. And so sometimes they're they're forced to eat ultra processed foods. And I think a good example of this is um, people who are in the military or who are abroad for long periods of time um, or potentially in war zones, they, you know, have to eat uh, military ready meals or MREs uh, for long periods of time. And, and it's just for nutrition. They're hypercaloric. They're not the most nutritional, but they provide enough energy for a soldier to maintain, uh, right. maintain themselves in the field. Um, and so oftentimes, even these people come back with with higher risks for cancers, and, and that's something actually that the Veterans Affairs Department, in especially in the United States, is is trying to pay more attention to as well. Gotcha. What about like organic food? So like organic vegetables, fruits versus non-organic. Sure. Yeah. So um, a big part of this discussion comes up with um, pesticides on foods. Um, you know, and I've tried to to be as clear as possible with this message too, because. I think people have this assumption that organic foods don't use pesticides or don't have any sort of genetic modifications to these foods to enable a sufficient crop yield. And so this is an agricultural perspective. Um, if we didn't apply pesticides to even organic foods, you wouldn't have enough of a yield. Or if we didn't genetically modify these foods in a particular way, again, we wouldn't have enough of a yield to be able to distribute enough food for the amount of people in a given environment. So people need to understand that these these foods also have pesticides on them, mm. but the amounts of them may be lower. And so that might, you know, shift the argument in favor of consumption of organic foods. But, you know, I, I will say I, I've never really been privileged enough to consume organic foods because they are typically more expensive and often for not very good reason. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, um, Hypothetically, based on things that we can observe from research, people who consume organic foods may have reduced risks from some of the, the crop cultivation methods. <clears throat> But I would rather people focus on consuming enough veggies, even if there's very low trace amounts of glyphosate on those uh, foods, um, because the pros vastly outweigh the cons there. So, mm. of course, if people have the ability to consume organic foods, cool, why not? But um, for me, it's more so just about getting people to to eat a sufficient amount of vegetables because in either camp, um, the pros outweigh the cons for vegetable consumption, even if there's, you know, pesticides or things on it um, and very trace amounts. Mm. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, for sure. Like, I agree. Like, the, the you know, non-organic food is still healthier than the ultra-processed foods. <laughs> so yeah. it shouldn't be like a barrier to entry that, oh no, that I can't afford the organic food. Yeah. And again, it doesn't have to be extreme, right? People can consume a lot of vegetables or a sufficient amount of vegetables, and it's going to vary between people, but they can enjoy ultra-processed foods. Again, I I enjoy ice cream. I enjoy my cereals that have some of these dyes in the United States. And of course, it varies in, in you know, depending on where you are in the world, because For reasons unknown to me, Kellogg ships up the types of dyes that it uses in different countries. Um, all of them, you know, have certain risks or maybe even different names, but they're the same compound in different countries. They all have different risks, but people can consume processed food safely. It's just, you know, mm. they shouldn't be your main source of nutrition. Yeah. By any, they're, they're treats. They're in, for enjoyment. Right. I think this, this can be like a good point to introduce the idea of the carcinogen. So like, That's this cancer promoting food or compound or molecule, whatever. Uh, so yeah, like what is it? And like with uh, with these carcinogens, like you know, certain certain like conventional foods are considered carcinogens as well in certain amounts. So like what determines the the uh, the, the uh, effects on uh, on cancer with uh, these these compounds? Um. Can you give me an example of which carcinogens so I can I can kind of bounce off um, that? You you we can like maybe start with uh I guess uh you, you know any amount of smoking is generally like you know considered very bad or ha harmful for health but with other things it's kind of a gray zone like you know ultra processed food I'm not sure if it is a considered a carcinogen but with like 
meat, for example, like mm-hmm. uh, processed meat, you know, it's uh, considered a carcinogen. Uh, so like what, 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 what amounts would uh, be uh, considered like cancer promoting? I guess. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. And it's, it's one I see often, especially in relation to, to things like red meats. Of course, if we have the ability, we should always be consuming uh, non-processed foods because we definitely see a strong correlation between processed food consumption um, and cancers as we've, you know, we've spoken about here. Um, But that dose relationship is, is almost impossible to determine in a way that makes sense to an individual. Um, because it is hyper variable, and mm. despite having strong correlations in relation to red meats, as an example, and cancers, it's it's again going to depend on um, the overall quality of a person's diet. So, as an example, you know, just using myself somewhat anecdotally, and and it's also in support of the literature. Um, I consume a lot of red meat in my diet, and I'm not afraid to have deli meats that are prepackaged from the the store. Um, but again, I don't eat deli meats super often such that they're going to cause problems or significantly increase risks. And those risks again are, are quite low, assuming my diet is pretty well balanced based on my own energetic needs and my own training plan and those sorts of things, my own health implications. Cause I have my own, uh, digestive issues that I deal with. So I eat a lot of red meat, but when I do eat red meat, I ensure that it's, you know, leaner cuts. Um, I try to eat less processed sources, you know, beef is obviously processed when it's cut steaks, they're processed when it's cut and packaged. Obviously the level of processing is more when it's, you know, packaged deli meats, unless you're going right to the deli and they're cutting it directly off of a, a a hunk of ham or something like that. So the level of preservatives in those is obviously going to be lower, but regarding these carcinogens, the things that makes even even red meats carcinogenic, if I consume them at high enough quantity in my diet uh, relative to other foods and I don't have enough vegetables or fiber, sometimes you can induce the production of carcinogens based on even just how we cook foods. So, you know, again, I love steak, right? I'll keep going back to this argument. I love chicken, but if I cook steak and chicken on the grill at high heats, um, you know, because they're obviously the most delicious that way and, and anyone can argue that point with me. But that charring, that that crispiness, that deliciousness that we get in that that chemical reactions on the meat through grilling, they induce the production of carcinogens. Um, and if I consume enough of grilled meats, independent of level of processing, um, I will also increase my risk for cancer. So, obviously, the cooking method also is is very important for for protein sources. And you can even for for plant proteins, you can induce those same carcinogens by uh, high heat on plant plant based sources too, mm. so you know right. it's it's kind of it's there's always a trade off and nothing's ever going to be perfect, um, and the carcinogens always vary and the level of mechanisms that varied carcinogens have on our bodies um, play very different roles in how they can mutate cancers and so you know these carcinogens generated from High heat cooking of meat sources are very different than uh, radioisotope interactions or radiation interactions, uh, whether it's you know ionic radiation or non-ionic radiation like ultraviolet rays. Um, mm. So there, there's a multitude of behaviors going back to what we previously said, the top things that people can do to reduce risks for diseases like cancer. There's a multitude of behaviors we need to adopt relative to our nutrition, but also being safe to try and avoid carcinogens when we can. You mentioned smoking, you mentioned alcohol consumption as factors. Um, I think it's unrealistic to say that people should quit smoking and and quit alcohol consumption immediately. Um, Of course, minimizing those things is very important. Um, But, you know, they're they're a a part of a whole picture of things we should be doing to to reduce risks. Mm, Right. Yeah, it's never like a single risk factor is going to be the the straw that broke the camel's back it's okay. it's more about yeah, like the cumul- cumulative effect of all these different uh, things uh, in yeah. our environment plus the diet plus yeah other other factors yeah and even sleep i didn't touch on sleep like now we know enough about circadian biology which you've also spoken about even in today's post on your on your platform um you know circadian biology uh, chronic sleep disruption is now considered a carcinogen Mm. Uh, because in cancers there's also um 
dysregulation of circadian biology in ways that can increase risks for cancers. So we often see this in people who um, who are shift workers, people who have chronic dysregulation in their sleep habits. They have significantly increased risk for cancers because they're messing with the very diverse circadian biology mechanisms that uh, humans have evolved to have um, to maintain their health. So alongside, you know, effective nutrition and exercise, sleep health is also incredibly, incredibly important um, for for reducing cancer risk. So again, add that to the the behaviors of things, you know? Mm, yeah. Would it be fair to say then that like, okay, what actually, you know, the, all these factors, all these carcinogens uh, in, in everywhere, would it be fair to say then that like what actually determines the cancer risk is the person's, you know, immune system, immune function, and, you know, the, I guess, uh, the resilience or something like that to uh, maintain these checkpoints in, in there to uh, prevent the cancer? Not entirely. Um, a person's immune, immune system integrity certainly plays a role. Mm -hmm. And it is strengthened by how we exercise as well. So um, anatomically, our muscle cells drive the lymphatic system fluid movement in our body. Our lymphatic system contains our immune cells in our body. And you've probably heard me speak about this on a variety of different podcasts or even posts. But our muscle cell contractions, our skeletal muscle drives lymphatic fluid movement in our body, makes our immune cells move throughout our body. And of course, the more we move as humans, within reason, obviously, the rest is important, as we've just spoken about sleep. Um, the more we move, the more we increase the ability of our immune system to do its job, no matter the level of genetic uh, differences and heritable differences between, uh, between different people's immune systems. So the immune system is definitely an integral part. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's hard to understand the strength of one person's immune system between each other because, um, you know, I got started in cancer biology by studying immune related cancers. And, um, you know, you have to understand a lot about the immune system that even if I was a genetic twin, if I had a genetic identical twin, our immune systems would still be wildly different from, uh, from an immune system perspective because of a lot of variables that govern immune cell biology. Um, and that's actually a very important evolutionary perspective from immune cell development. If they can't change these things, they can't adapt to our environment to protect us from not only cellular damage, but also pathogens. And as a genetic identical twin, we're going to have different interactions with our environments, and that's going to change how our immune system keeps us safe. So mm -hmm. this strength argument with immune system is somewhat um, primitive um, because it's not about how strong a person's immune system is. It's about what we're doing to enable our immune system to do its job with the tools that we've been given. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't do things throughout our lives or throughout our lives to enable our immune system to do its job. Mm. And so there's, again, there's a lot of overlap between our behaviors like exercise and nutrition that um, enable our immune system to be more efficient. And that strength is, is relative. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Uh, so meat, maybe we can talk about meat now. So sure. that's very like commonly thought to be uh, cancer promoting. So uh, yeah, we can talk about, we mentioned, you know, a processed meat that's like considered a carcinogen, but uh, unprocessed meat isn't like a carcinogen in of itself. Uh, I guess it's called like uh, potentially carcinogenic, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. like, yeah, what's the relationship uh, with that? Yeah. So as, as I pointed out previously, um, unprocessed meat is still technically a little bit processed because it has to be, you know, cut off of a cow <laughs> process, shipped to the supermarket. Right. So there is a level of processing there. It's just not hyper processed or ultra processed. And I think that's mm. the difference between packaged deli meats and like a, yeah. you know, a, a piece of chicken or, or steak or pork on a styrofoam thing that you get from a fresh deli or even a butcher. Um, and so you can, again, you can generate carcinogens on these meats by high heat cooking. You can generate mm -hmm. heterocyclic amines or polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs and H, um, HCAs, um, which are car carcinogens, um, despite the level of processing in these meats. Um, 
And so that's what makes them potentially carcinogenic. It's it's typically about how we cook them. Mm. And another driver is again the the amounts of these meats that we're consuming relative to our diet. So again, I can't stress this enough. People need to consume more than just um red meats or chicken in their diet. Uh carnivore diet is not favorable for good human health outcomes. So in relation to a person's overall diet, they need to be consuming a lot of different vegetables, a lot of different types of meats. Typically, leaner meats are better. Um, dairy is also an integral component for, for a person's um, health and well-being. There's a lot of uh, flack online from that. There's a lot of people who are anti-dairy. And then even on the extremist end, there are people that are consuming raw milk, um, which from its source, um, raw milk can be safely consumed. But um, you know, pasteurization is very important. Um, because it protects you from microbes because there are microbial, as we mentioned, there are microbial implications for, for cancers. You don't want to get bacterial infections like H. pylori, um, salmonella from meat sources and, and even, even dairy products, um, that can induce cancers. So yeah, mm, I can't be, gotcha. I don't think I can make that any more clear. <laughs> yeah. With meat and dairy, like, um, the, like a mechanism for the cancer is usually mentioned the mTOR pathway, which is this uh, growth pathway, and uh, that's also like in in aging research is considered to be like uh, a pathway that shortens uh, lifespan. So, what's uh, yeah like the role of mTOR in uh, cancer? Yeah, so mTOR mTOR is a really important enzyme involved with protein metabolism balance. Um, that's the simplest way I can put that. But essentially, mTOR responds to a lot of different things, but largely variations in amino acids like uh, branch chain amino acids like isoleucine, leucine, and valine in the environment uh, surrounding cells. And it's it's very important for you know normal, healthy muscle tissue and a variety of things to sense the amount of you know, uh, amino acids in the environment for you know, inducing things like muscle protein synthesis. And, you know, obviously when we exercise, we induce mTOR metabolism in our muscle cells. And that actually is, is very important, um, necessary, in fact, for enabling muscle growth. Um, but in cancers, again, it's, it's wildly different. The mTOR metabolism in cancers is wildly different and imbalanced in cancers. And that's what makes it a problem in cancers is because you can have too much of a good thing. So mTOR metabolism is too upregulated because, or too increased because cancer cells are trying to take in amino acids for their own energetic needs. And so that's why we've tried with somewhat minimal success. There are inhibitors like rapamycin uh, for things like mTOR. There are now better ones these days. And for right now, it's escaping the name of me because there's a million different uh, small molecules and sometimes even large molecules to inhibit this enzyme. But there's a variety of different things to target mTOR metabolism in cancers because, again, it's dysregulated in an unfavorable way that we try and use these therapies to restore some semblance of balance and induce cancer cell death. So they can't rely on those amino acids to maintain their energetic needs to continue growing. Mm. So I think mTOR is, again, it's very important, but it's it's often given this extremist and bad rap um that it's something that always either needs to be turned on or off yeah. uh, the same same argument is with you know inflammation and, and those sorts of things as well mm. but uh, that's the that's the short of it uh, of mTOR metabolism and cancers but there's right. again the, the mechanisms of mTOR depending on you know if it's in a cancer cell are diverse depending on what that cancer type is where it originated uh how late stage the cancer is if it's metastasized um, if it's within uh, fat tissue, um, so there's obviously rare cancers like liposarcoma that will utilize some level of mTOR metabolism as well, mm. despite being located in fatty tissue. Um, yeah. So it, everything needs to be personalized in a way. Mm. Yeah, like you need the uh, mTOR signaling for the muscle maintenance and exactly. to prevent frailty, etc. And uh, mm -hmm. there's yeah, like a double-edged sword with that yeah. because you know with uh, with cancer like you you can become quite frail right this uh, yeah, absolutely malnutrition yeah, and cachexia 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's again, that's one thing I've mentioned extensively on a, on a variety of different podcasts and now obviously yours. Um, but cachexia, muscle wasting, um, it is seen in the majority of cancer patients, is that especially those in late stage and actually contributes significantly to mortality of late stage cancer patients. About the research suggests about 80%. So minimizing muscle wasting is is integral for the survival of cancer patients. And that's, that's again, why I suggest, and even in relation to current research, suggesting the importance of exercise for cancer patients. That's why I suggest every cancer patient try and implement some level of safe exercise that they can realistically do, because it's going to vary depending on their surgeries, their treatments, their ability to do exercise. But every, every cancer patient needs to be implementing some level of exercise to try and reduce how frail they become, whether it's from treatment or if it's from the cancer itself, messing with something like mTOR metabolism, the, the degradation of muscle tissue. So while they might not be able to build muscle tissue, maintenance of that muscle tissue is also incredibly important in cancer patients, just as it is in uh, quote unquote normal, healthy, uh, non-cancerous human beings, so to speak. Yeah, that's, that's true. But is yeah. there like if you someone has cancer, or like are, are there treatment options with a low protein diet to like suppress the mTOR pathway so is it like this situation like with protein intake if you have kidney disease then it makes sense to like be on a low protein diet but a high protein diet inherently doesn't cause kidney disease yeah absolutely yeah no so believe it or not those are things that are starting to be investigated and they're they're newer um you know we've we've known a lot of different things about cancer cell metabolism and the energetics even since like the 1920 from like Otto Warburg's initial findings that, you know, glucose uptake is, is readily taken into cancer cells. And it's, it's a significant feature regarding uh, dysregulation of energetics in cancer cells, the Warburg effect, which you may have heard of. Um, so when it comes to dietary changes, which, which can implement, um, be implemented as a, a potential treatment strategy for cancers, we don't we don't know a lot right now, believe it or not, despite significant advancements in understanding cancer uh, metabolism. But there are a lot of clinical trials going on right now um, in humans. Um, there's also a lot of preclinical studies which suggest that certain dietary modalities like ketogenic diets, so high protein, lower carbohydrates, because there's a reliance on carbohydrates in many cancer types, not all cancer types. Um, so ketogenic diets can be helpful in, in, again, very specific context, not for all cancers. Um, and oftentimes, these dietary interventions rely on a combinatorial approach because the diets themselves can make the cancer worse. So remember earlier we said that cancer cells are selfish. If I induce a dietary change, let's say I have pancreatic cancer, the pancreatic cancer will adapt to the, the high protein now that's in the diet. And may even in some cases, based on what we've seen in the literature so far, some cases may become more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so obviously you don't want somebody to worsen their cancers by implementing a dietary change. But in becoming more aggressive, we open up a window of opportunity for introducing new targets that were not there before the diet. So the diet changed the metabolism of the cancer cells from both epigenetic perspectives and genetic perspectives and from metabolic perspectives. So now things that were not in the cancer cell before, they've adapted and evolved in a certain way that now things that weren't there before can now be targeted with uh, newer types of drugs. So does that make sense? It, essentially, diets can enable a window of opportunity mm. for things that wouldn't have worked yeah. before that will now work because of the change in metabolism. Right. Yeah, and and like... Yeah, like the cancer will adapt to whatever you're doing and yeah. uh, you need to change it up. So it, you, like you can't be doing the same protocol, I guess, or take the same drugs all the time. Yeah. You need to change it up. Yeah. And oftentimes we also need to understand clinically, there's a, a phenomenal scientist that I always talk about. Her name's Dr. Caroline Bartman. Um, she actually did her PhD in Dr. Joshua Rabinowitz's lab at Princeton. And I've seen her talk a few times, um, but she studies cancer metabolism and she alongside uh, Dr. Rabinowitz, um, Caroline, Dr. Bartman has her own lab now. 
Um, but alongside these two, that they they study how these diets impact cancer cell metabolism and how to safely implement diets into um, a cancer patient's treatment program. Like, again, I can't emphasize enough that these things need to be specifically implemented for specific types of cancers because as these scientists who are honestly much, much better and more well-versed uh, than me in cancer cell metabolism, uh, they point out that oftentimes these dietary changes, if they're not input into specific recommendations for sufficient rationale for good reason, they will affect normal healthy cells more negatively than they will affect cancer cells. So again, we, we need to be very careful about the dietary advice that we, that we give cancer patients um, because it can affect normal healthy cell biology oftentimes more than it will affect the cancer cell. But mm. again, it, it always depends on the trade-off as to whether or not that window of opportunity will be worth doing from a dietary intervention perspective to enable introduction of a, of a, of a new um, safe type of treatment to, to better treat that person's cancer. Mm. It's, it's always contextual. And I think one, these yeah. especially have to be personalized depending on, on someone's um, cancer needs, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, there's like an element of uh, randomness in cancer that needs to be considered. Yeah. Yeah, again, you can have you can have two people with the same exact type of cancer, both of those cancers operating very different from metabolic um and even genetic perspectives. They might look the same on the outside, but they despite being categorically the same operate very differently. Um and it's you know, it's 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 sad. I try and explain this complexity to people and I try and simplify it as much as I can, but I can't I can only simplify things to a certain point. Um, and I, I wish these things weren't as variable because obviously it would make, I'd be a billionaire. Like if these weren't as variable, I'd be able to easily treat this disease. <laughs> but this level of variation is, is so wildly complicated that no matter how I try and simplify things, um, it's just, uh, it's just really hard to convey at its core, even from a, "Quote unquote basic foundation. It's it's not basic by any means, despite knowing all these root causes of cancer. You know, mm, yeah. You, know, you mentioned the Warburg effect, and mm -hmm. um, like like loss is involved in cancer as well. So carbohydrate intake and sh sugar intake, etc. Like, I guess like sugar would be also considered like, or I don't know. You can clarify like, <laughs> what's the role of like uh, carbohydrates and the uh, sugar?" Are they considered like harmful for cancer or are they like more neutral or, or what's the situation there? Um, yeah, again, very complicated. Um, carbohydrates in most cases of cancers and a lot of scientists um, on a variety of different platforms, whether they're accurate or not, say this accurately that cancer cells are often fueled by increased glucose uptake and increased glycolytic metabolism. This is the Warburg effect. So back in the early 1920s, which actually got the, the Warburg, um, which actually got Otto Warburg the, the Nobel Prize, and even people like uh, the Corys, uh, Dr. Gertie Corey and her husband got the Nobel Prize for understanding a lot of this as well in conjunction to Dr. Otto Warburg, which I think people forget. Um, you know, female Nobel laureate as well. Uh, I want to pinpoint that there too, because we often complain that too many males get Nobel prizes, but I think people overshadow that. Anyways, um, cancer cells will often increase their rate of glucose uptake in cancer cells. But again, it's, it's, it's always about trade-offs. And usually this adaptation of increased glucose uptake, which can lead to the production of lactic acid, which is what Otto Warburg discovered, is non-conventional. It's not it's not a normal thing that cells will do all of the time. They can do it, but in very specific regulated environments. The problem with cancer is when they, they have too much of the Warburg effect because they're trying to maintain their growth as much as possible, somewhat selfishly, that um, they do change their metabolism in non-conventional ways. So they increase glucose uptake through glycolysis. They break it down. But instead of going through conventional pathways like the citric acid cycle to generate ATP through oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, 
It's a lot of jargon there. They will reroute the substrates generated from glycolysis into other pathways that supply greater need to a cancer cell in that moment. So again, it's selfish in a way. So it reroutes longer processes, longer enzymatic processes, because they take too much time as a trade-off for quicker processes um, to enable them to continue growing. So they'll take in glucose, shuttle it into pentose phosphate pathway, um, various different substrates to produce uh, DNA uh, nucleic acid precursors, because obviously with continued cell division, you need more DNA to replicate DNA and you need more DNA to continue growing. So they will do that more quickly. So they sacrifice efficiency often for speed. And with that sacrifice comes a lot of significant problems that eventually, again, leads to uh, maladaptive characteristics um, as cancer patients progress in their disease. So in summary, that's, that's the Warburg effect. Uh, so glucose can make things worse. The amount of glucose we consume, especially if it's, you know, added sugars relative in our diet, you know, given ultra processed foods and caloric intake, they can impact a cancer patient's outcomes. But in no way, shape or form does this mean that people should starve themselves of carbohydrates because again, if you do so, you will affect normal healthy tissue significantly more than you will affect the messed up cancer cell that can just adapt to a different demand, even if you starve it of carbohydrates. Right. You know, it'll start breaking down your muscle tissue to get amino acids for protein. Guess what? If you're not consuming carbohydrates, it'll rely on the glycogen within your liver um, or even make its own uh, glucose through gluconeogenesis in the liver. It'll steal some of the glucose from your muscle if it's not getting enough protein from muscle tissue or your liver. It'll steal some of the glucose, which is stored in your muscle, which is really high concentrations, which I think people also fail to uh, understand. Because again, it's complicated. I don't expect everybody to understand this stuff. Yeah, it's, so, it's like uh, can the cancers also then use uh, ketones? Uh, so yeah. if, if the person is put on like a ketogenic diet, then the cancer will adapt to that and start using ketones or what's the situation there? Yeah, yeah. So in, in many cases, um, even in pancreatic cancers, we've seen this um, and liver cancers too. We've seen cancer cells um, largely in preclinical work uh, through very complex mechanisms. Um, and even in some clinical studies in humans now, um, yeah, so cancer cells can use ketones and things like beta hydroxybutyrate, um, substrates generated through ketogenesis to enable cancer cell metabolism in, in ways that promote growth as well. So yeah, people need to realize that these things are adaptive very, very quickly because again, they need that speed to continue growing because that's what makes it cancer. Mm. And, uh, yeah, these dietary changes and these interventions, they have risks um, more often to normal healthy tissue than they do the cancer cells. So that's why we need to be very careful. So going back to glucose and amino acids and fatty acids, any macromolecule you want to name, cancer cells can use it. We have plenty of literature now to show a variety of different diverse mechanisms between many different types of cancers that show they can use all different nucleic acids to some degree. They can use most different amino acids. I just put a post out about serine um, to regulate uh, glutathione synthesis to, to deal with oxidative stress in cancer cells. They can use glutamate, which is often commonly upregulated in a variety of cancers, even some that I've published on um, as a substrate to bypass glucose degradation to go you know, directly into the citric acid cycle. Mm -hmm. um, a variety of diverse types of carbohydrates, not even glucose. Um, not even just glucose. And, and even, you know, a lot of these sugars uh, are very important for maintaining internal protein function. So cancer cells will often deregulate large epigenetic profiles, which change this process called glycosylation in cells. And, and this glycosylation is very, very important for trafficking of proteins inside cells and getting to the cell surface. Without those um, addition of, of sugar moieties, these, these different types of sugars to proteins, they, they're destabilized. They can't perform their functions appropriately. So cancer cells also deregulate these broadly. And that's also another problem in, in cancers too, is regulating sugar metabolism, not only from a glucose perspective, but from regulating protein turnover rate in relation to 
modifications on proteins like uh, glycosylation, which mm. I also studied significantly. Right. And I, guess I know like, that was a lot, and I, uh, I apologize for that, but I thought it was important to add a lot of context there. No, I, I think it's uh, great. But, uh, and the same applies to fasting as well, that, you know, fasting works partly through ketosis and it works mm -hmm. partly through autophagy. And we mentioned that uh, the cancer adapts to both of them uh, to a certain extent. So that then like fasting itself is also something that, you know, could be used yeah. But then you need to be also like realize that uh, the cancer can adapt to it, then you can't do the same thing indefinitely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can't stress this enough, too, is that these things are helpful. I don't want to, you know, crap on the research that's been done and say that it's insufficient. But right now it is technically insufficient. We still have a lot to learn about how we can apply these things and when we should apply them regarding a even a chronotherapy or time based strategy of when to apply them. For the treatment of diverse cancer types, um, depending on the cancer type and the staging and all those sorts of things. So right. it can be useful. We just have a lot to learn about how we use them and when when we use them. Mm. One question in in regards to nutrition is also like artificial sweeteners. So uh, uh, are they also carcinogenic and cancer promoting like aspartame and sucralose, et cetera? Yeah. Um, this this is along the same lines of argument as synthetic dyes in some ways, um, but there are a lot of pros. Assuming people don't overconsume again, overconsumption of things like aspartame and synthetic sweeteners can have problems. But if they're used correctly, the well, not correctly. I guess if they're used in a way to promote healthy behaviors in a person's diet, they can be used to reduce risks. So again, it's it's always about trade-offs. It's always about pros and cons. Mm. Um, so while the literature might point to some level of risk for things like aspartame, um, albeit very low, people typically, again, are not going to consume enough of these in a dose that is going to significantly increase their risks. But if I am overweight, even if I'm not overweight, I regularly consume artificially sweetened beverages. I mean, there are some natural, quote unquote, naturally sweetened artificial or naturally sweetened beverages, the zero calorie. Um, I think zero calorie is important to note there. But if people are consuming these to regulate their caloric intake, um, because if they are overweight and they, you know, they want a sweet beverage, but they don't want to have a can of Coke, but they really like Coca-Cola, they can, they can get a Coke Zero. You know, they can right. get something with acesulfame or a a aspartame in it. Um, and in that case, the pros outweigh the cons because they're reducing their caloric intake. Yeah, there might be some risk with the, again, very low risk. There might be some risk with the artificial sweetener in the drink that they're drinking, but they're losing weight, right? So, you know, they're not increasing the amount of added sugars in their diet because they, they're still able to enjoy something within reason. Mm. Um, and again, I think it's this level of extremism that we need to get rid of that. People can still consume these these things that have some level of risk just because something is no risk again or, or low risk doesn't mean zero risk but it's right. always about the pros and cons with something like synthetic dyes and ultra processed foods there's no nutritional value to those so the, the, for me there's no pros to the consumption of these synthetic dyes other than the fact that we're being psychologically manipulated mm -hmm. um, by these companies to consume these foods because they're more bright they're more visually appealing but there's no nutritional value for those there's no nutritional uh, there's no nutritional value for things like aspartame or these artificial sweeteners, but they have the added benefit of helping us to regulate caloric intake. Again, it's right. it's a tool that, if used appropriately, can implement changes which help somebody reduce cancer risks despite having very low risks themselves. Mm. Always pros and cons. Right. People would rather live in the extremist lands though and just say that aspartame is bad. Get it out of your diet, mm -hmm. and then. They're more likely to relapse into these behaviors where, you know, they don't enjoy that sweet beverage and then they go into potentially overconsuming ultra processed foods. So I'd rather people have some level of balance and weigh these risks or hazard risks and ratios to their lives than be in specific camps and create their own echo chambers about uh, extreme life lifestyles and perfectionism that realistically, uh, you know, domino effect into more poor behaviors, which increase disease risks, not even for just cancers. Mm. 
So, and I guess yeah, the dose is like pretty important with uh, the sweeteners. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, I don't know like the the doses, uh, but l- let's say how many Dutch cokes you would have to drink per day to increase yeah. your cancer risk. <laughs> how many? Yeah, I mean and- it's it's a lot. You know, if if we rely on the math that's done in these studies, and even with you know even for cereals for something like preservatives like BHT, if we do the math based on these these studies. I calculated one time that, you know, for like frosted flakes, you'd have to consume like <laughs> a couple hundred maybe or a thousand boxes of frosted flakes a day <laughs> to get enough BHT. Uh, for aspartame, it's like 333.666666 cans of Coke, uh, cans of uh, Coke Zero um, or Diet Coke to have carcinogenic effects associated with aspartame that we've seen in these studies. But again, realistically, people aren't consuming that much BHT or, or that much. And if they are, they're going to have other problems that are far outside the BHT or the <laughs> aspartame. Yeah, They're going to be so nutritionally deficient that independent of the aspartame or BHT, <laughs> their liver is going to be shot. Their kidneys are going to be shot. <laughs> Yeah. Their heart won't be able to maintain its metabolism. So it's just from a physiological perspective. We can yeah. hyperfixate on these carcinogens, but it does people no good if they're they're hyperfixating on them to ignore the more important things. In other words, they're they're missing the forest for the trees. Right. Yeah, and with that coke, it's like you would have first physically explode <laughs> before you uh yeah. consume and that. Nonetheless much. from just the carbon dioxide, right? God, right. I'd have horrible problems. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about so we we can mention some of these like environmental factors as well. So microplastics, um, chemicals, personal care products. You know, sure. there's they're everywhere, and we can I guess we they're different, obviously, but uh, we can like mention them uh, in a kind of same group of these environmental chemicals, uh, everyday chemicals in in our life. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, a, a good example or a few examples of these are like PFAs. Um, um, within a lot of water sources, as an example, and even microplastics in water sources. Um, there are studies that show that those can increase risks, and they make significant sense from a logical perspective as to how they can do that. Obviously, you shouldn't be consuming uh, plastics or PFAs to any degree. Um, you know, the same that we shouldn't really be consuming, you know, petroleum-based products that can't be broken down, like benzene, as an example known and actual carcinogens um, that have significant risk factors for cancers. Um, But when it comes to like things in our environment, like microplastics and PFAs, um, you know, there's a lot of realistic things that we can do. Like we can, we can buy specific water filters. I'm not affiliated with any companies. I think one thing you might notice with my page is that I don't try and sell um, a lot of things to people. Um, I just try and give people the information that they need. Um, but there are a lot of filters that people can buy to reduce the amounts of, you know, microplastics and PFAs in their water sources because a lot of our infrastructure utilizes things like PVC um, to enable water flow and water distribution between cities. Obviously, that's a, a good thing um, from industrialization purposes, but that comes with the risks of degradation of PVC. Obviously, PVC is not the greatest product. Um, for distribution of water across cities. And so you end up with sometimes microplastics and PFAs and water sources. And um, sometimes at higher concentrations, depending on where you live in the world, um, obviously larger cities have have somewhat higher risks. And so it might be important for people who live in cities, um, despite you know having really effective water treatment strategies in their cities, usually ozone-related strategies to treat water. Um, it might be important for these people to have these types of filters, like uh, like HydroViv filters, as a company. Again, I'm not affiliated with them. I just think it's a great project uh, product um, to filter out a lot of these things that can just naturally come from maybe poor choices that humans have made over time. That now we're realizing in our infrastructure through industrialization that have somewhat put us at risks. Um, so these filters can be helpful. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean. Uh you know that they are so they do impose some risk like these uh, environmental microplastics and xenoestrogens and, and those kind of things 
So mm -hmm. I, again, it's more about yeah, like the dose and uh, trying to minimize the unnecessary uh, exposure. Yeah, again, with within realism, like there's, mm -hmm. you know, we're in a developed society. Most of us, especially in the United States, it's um, you're in Finland. I don't know too much about. Or you're in Finland, right? Uh, I'm in uh, Estonia, so that's uh, okay. South, you're in Estonia. Finland, yeah. Okay, my bad. Sorry, <laughs> big mistake there. Um, so yeah, I um, you know, I don't know much about your society, but here in the United States, you know, depending on our our infrastructure, there there's obviously a lot of safeguards we can put into place within realism uh, to reduce our intakes of of these things. And you've probably heard me say the dose makes the poison, but um, you know, I don't want to go to some extremist end to say that. We can avoid these things entirely because that does depend on the societies that we live in. We should just do our best where we can to try and reduce our consumption of these things because they do have risks. Again, uh, low risk ain't the same as as no risk. So, mm, right, yeah. gotcha. Um, same issue with radiation as well. Mm, yeah, I mean the sun gives <laughs> exposes us to radiation, but yeah. it's, you know some amounts is healthy. Too much might yeah. be bad. Not yeah. enough is also unhealthy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. From a lot of diverse perspectives. Yeah. So, mm. yeah. Right. I mean, we can't, we can't avoid that as much as we can. Um, things like microplastics, we have better control methods for things like that, but obviously, you know, our, um, our atmosphere, we don't have too much control over to some regard. We can try and preserve it as much as we can, but radiation, there's only so much you can do. Mm. Right. <clears throat> and obviously depending on the type of radiation. Yeah. Right. I feel like we have to do like a part two <laughs> for sure to uh, go through like the treatment availabilities and uh, diagnostics mm -hmm. and those kind of things as well in the future, because yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to like start wrapping up. But sure. uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to do a part two. Uh, before, my, yeah. before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so I, um, I do most of my work on Instagram. Um, I don't really do much outside of of that, um, and, you know, in terms of producing reels and graphics for people to try and critically think about cancer biology in a way that maybe a lot of other people are not doing. Um, there's a lot of oversimplification in the space, obviously. So mm -hmm. I try and provide simplicity while trying to help enable people to understand that it is a complex disease and realistically people just need to catch up, so to speak, and, and, and I'm there for that, basically. So mostly on Instagram. I have my own website, uh, drjoesundell.com. Um, I don't have any realistic streams of revenue um, outside of this. I try and maintain a free resource just because obviously there's enough paywalls in science and, and I just try and give my education to people so that they can make better decisions about, about their life and, and again, in a realistic way in understanding how um, cancer uh, understanding as a disease can help implement disease risk reduction strategies um, in, in our society, which will actually translate well to other disease. So Instagram, you can find me on my website. I have a TikTok. I don't use it too often. Um, I have a LinkedIn. If people can follow me there from a more business-related perspective, they can see where I work. I work at a, actually a targeted radio pharmaceutical development company called Actis Oncology in Durham, North Carolina, in the United States. Um, and actually, that's we can talk about that next time regarding um, radio diagnostics. Uh, I touched on it a little bit here, but that's, that's something that's, that you should be, and everybody should be on the lookout for is the development of radio diagnostics. It's truly amazing, uh, what we can do with, with radioactive isotopes, mm, um, sure. in a, obviously in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, my last question is, um, what's this one piece sort of, a, of a, advice or a habit that you uh, wish you adopted sooner? Oh, give me a second. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. What's one thing I adopted sooner? I should have adopted sooner. Frequent health checkups. I uh, Admittedly, I haven't always been good about my checkups at the doctor. I've been very stubborn. I think myself included. I think a lot of people are afraid to go to the doctor's office because they're afraid to find out um, whether or not things are wrong. And 
this is something I, I actively preach as well on my platform. It's better to have knowledge and be scared about something. Um, and also have the knowledge to be equipped to do something about something that you discover than not know and suddenly um, have severe issues that can't be treated. So mm. one thing I'm trying to implement in my um, older age, I'm not obviously old, but I'm you know getting older. I'm 33 now, which for all intents and purposes is not old. Some people will critique that. Um, I'm trying to pay more attention to my doctor's visits. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously in a position where I have relatively, you know, in the United States, health insurance is a bit of a, of an issue, but I have better health insurance and now I'm, I'm more equipped to do that. So it is a little bit of a privilege, but, you know, I think it's important for people to try not to be so afraid from a monetary perspective, um, and a health perspective that independent of that, we just, you know, we all have to be better about getting checkups from, from doctors so we can find potential issues when they can be uh, reasonably treated or um, fixed, so to speak. Mm. So that's something that I'm realizing as I, as I get older. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Checking up is, you know, one of the most, or like regular check checkups are, yeah, like super important. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for coming to the show. It was uh, great to talk with you. And uh, yeah, it. people should look out for part two of our conversation in the near, near future. Yeah, it'll be great. Thanks a lot, Sim. I really appreciate it. Yes, my pleasure. All right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.